Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the ninth meeting of the Welfare Reform Committee for 2014. Uh, could everyone please uh, make sure that the mobile phones and electronic devices are switched off. Agenda item one this morning, the first item of business, is a decision on whether consideration of the committee's approach to the Scottish Government draft budget 2014 should be taken in private at all future meetings. Do members agree? Mm -hmm. Okay, and that brings us then to the second item, which is an evidence session on the review of the Scottish Welfare Fund interim scheme. We took evidence on the Scottish Welfare Fund from a range of local authorities and the Minister for Housing and Welfare on the 18th of March. It's expected that these evidence sessions will form the committee's work on the Scottish Welfare Fund bill, which we expect to be introduced next month. I'd like to introduce back, uh, sorry, to welcome back Dr. Philip Sosenko, Research Associate, the uh, School of Built Environment at Heriot Watt University, who gave evidence to the committee on the 4th of March on another study he conducted for the Scottish Government on food aid. And I'd also like to welcome his colleague Mandy Littlewood, who's a visiting research fellow at the Institute for Housing, Urban and Real Estate Research at Heriot Watt University. Now, I understand that you want to make uh, some introductory comments, so I'll just pass over to you and then we'll take questions and discussions after that. Uh, good morning and thank you very much. Um, um, uh, maybe I'll start with a, a brief um, overview of, of um, what uh, what we've done. Um, in August last year we were tasked by the Scottish Government with um, carrying out a qualitative study into um, how um, the interim arrangements for the Scottish Welfare Farm, uh, Fund were, were working. Um, um, so um, the um, the aim of the of the study was to inform the, the permanent uh, arrangements and uh, specifically to add depth to the administrative and statistical um, um, data, statistical ev evidence uh, about the operation of the interim uh, arrangements. Um, what uh, myself, Mandy, and um, two colleagues from Heriot Watt did was um, uh, we um, firstly um, carried out interviews and small group um, discussions with uh, third sector on organizations. Uh, that was in October and November last year. Uh, we um, uh, we um, um, interviewed 15 uh, third sector support organizations uh, representing um, um, a range of um, um, clients, um, various um, equality groups, various uh, vulnerabilities. Um, um, and then he, over January, February and March this year, we interviewed uh, 77 applicants um, to the Scottish Welfare Fund. Um, uh, we carried out in-depth uh, interviews uh, with, with them. Um, the 77 people we, we interviewed, um, uh, uh, again, were quite uh, ver uh, varied in their in their background and circumstances. Um, uh, some of them uh, were um, um, did not uh, have um, um, specifically um, uh, did did not really uh, have vulnerabilities. Some of them had medium kind of level vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities, and some of them had um, highly complex needs. Um, um, again, there was um, there was um, a, a good split between uh, people who uh, were successful in their application, those who were partially successful, and those who were unsuccessful. Um, um, and again, a, a good um, spread of equality groups and um, and um, types of vulnerability. Um, um, in terms of um, headline findings. Um, uh, in in our view, um, um, it, it, the, the interim arrangements were um, are clearly a, a, a good start, um, and um, um, but there are there are areas for for improvement. Um, some of uh, some of our recommendations are probably quite straightforward and and relatively easy to implement. Some are probably less less easy to implement. Um, um looking at the at um specific um findings um we found that um scottish welfare fund staff um in general come across well and and are are helpful and and supportive um 
to, uh, to applicants. Um, uh, but there is a um, there is a problem with um, um, accessibility in that not um, not everyone um, definitely not everyone uh, who is in need and who, who, who could benefit from the from from the fund uh, is aware of it um, uh, and um, third sector uh, the, the awareness and, and knowledge of the fund uh, among first sector support uh, third sector organization uh, staff uh, varied so um, there is there is a room for improvement there um, uh, we found um, some evidence of um, gatekeeping on the part on the part of um, of um, Scottish Welfare Fund uh, staff. Um, that's why we've put forward a recommendation that all attempts at applying should be should be logged uh, onto the system. Um, and um, um, there, um, some applicants um, uh, who we interviewed were concerned about. Uh, how long it takes um, to to get a decision, um, and um, and there were also concerns that uh, not um, not all decisions um, are clear. Uh, it, it's not always clear how decisions are made and how how they are justified. So we've put forward recommendations um, uh, with regards to that as well. Um, and finally, there is there is a room for improvement in, in terms of um, joined up working and signposting in particular. Um, I think I'll stop here. Um, thank you. Aslo, do, do you want to make any comments? Yes, I, I think broadly um, I would say that for, for, the, for the length of time it's been running and for the length of time it took to put up and running, um, the schemes you know, made a very good start. I think we must commend staff for that, that the, the staff come across well to the users. Um, people feel that they are dealt with well, that people really empathise with their situation. They don't always get the outcome that they wanted, um, but, but by and large they understand that and they realise that, that not everybody can... Uh, can can get access to the monies, but as Philip said, there are there are areas where we see um, the need for some improvement in terms of, I suppose you would say how transparent the scheme is and and how um, how easy it is to access. Certainly, that's uh, that's two key areas for for improvement. Uh, and in terms of decision making, um, making sure that um, advocates for um, applicants are are kept in the loop because often it's the advocates rather than the applicants themselves who would um, engage in the review process. Um, because applicants tend to be vulnerable, there is a tendency for them to give up if they get a negative response, whereas obviously if they were in touch with someone who would help them as part of a review, they're more inclined to be uh, involved in a review. So I think that's a particularly important aspect to, uh, to improve on. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, I'll start by asking just a couple of questions uh, to get some clarification. Um, when uh, After the, the SWF was introduced, there was some widening and adaptation of the, the criteria. Uh, the people that you interviewed, were some of them interviewed having been through the, the, the process before the changes and some after? Is that the case? Uh, yes, some of them... Um uh, apply to the SWF um, before October 2000, uh, October last year, um, when when the criteria was um, were, were uh, relaxed for the first time. Um, but um, um, we um, the criteria um, were fair were further relaxed um, in April this year. But so uh, people we interviewed, obviously uh, because we interviewed them between January and March. So so. Um, uh, yeah, that f latest um, change to to um, the guidance uh, is we didn't pick it up in our uh, in our research. Mm -hmm. um, we were told uh, at the outset that the, the sort of um, principles of the the uh, SWF for it for it to be um, flexible and adaptable. But in your uh, report, it says an emphasis on strict adherence to the rules and criteria rather than discretion in decision making was sort of evident. Um, what was driving that? If, if people were, those who were uh, administering the, the SWF were 
adhering to strict rules and criteria, then why were they missing out on the principle of flexibility and, and adap adaptability? Um, well, um, what we found was that um, this could be attributed to the um, staff culture among um, revenues and benefits um, uh, staff who are um, princi principally in charge of um, processing housing benefit and council tax benefit or council tax reductions, uh, which do not require discretion. So there is a um, there is this um, phenomenon which we call the cultural shift, which they face, which they face. Um, um, so, so yes, they you know um, those are people who. Um, you know, perhaps in the morning are processing housing benefit applications where, where the criteria are very strict and there is there is no discretion. Um, uh, and then in the afternoon they are processing, you know, Scottish Welfare Fund applications where, where you know, uh, the emphasis is on discretion. So there is, there is you know, they are under tension, uh, I would, I would so say. It's a cultural thing rather than, mm -hmm. than actually... I think that's why in the recommendations, one of the areas that we've pointed towards is, is um, staff training and perhaps mentoring through um, contact with maybe social work staff or staff that are engaged more um, with vulnerable groups who might who might be able to offer um, you know uh, insights into the kind of broader skill set that that's needed to deal with quite complex cases and to 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 have that flexibility and responsiveness. Up to colleagues, Annabelle. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, and thank you very much indeed for the report, uh, which I find very interesting. Um, uh, you mentioned, uh, Dr. Shangso, that um, the you know, in terms of your recommendations, uh, uh, some would appear to you to be easier to implement than others, and some you said may be more difficult to implement. Could you give us a few examples of the ones at that end of the spectrum that you think might be more difficult? Well, we've to uh, we've we've um, put forward a recommendation that all um, applicants should be sent a decision letter and that um, um, advocates um, should be um, uh, copied into the decision if, if the applicant has given um, um, uh, the permission um, uh, for, for SWF staff to do so. Um, so that's, that, I think that's fairly straightforward and, and um, should be easy to implement. Uh, but for example, the, the, the um, issue of, st of staff culture uh, that's um, you know that requires more training you know it's um, um, it's it's less straightforward uh, I think um, um, yes, it's still doable but mm -hmm. uh, you know I think the whole idea of discretion is quite difficult you know by its nature discretion starts to open up the possibility of variability and that, and that's why I think accountability and transparency are really important, and and that's an area where you know, in terms of it not being at zero cost, having better monitoring of people who don't apply, it you know that that takes local authorities a step further than they're monitoring at the moment, and clearly you know ongoing monitoring is always an area that that is costly and and needs staff resources. So if you, if if you are pointing towards monitoring gatekeeping. Then that level of monitoring is is harder, and uh, and it's quite a financial commitment to put structures in place to have very good monitoring, uh, to make sure that uh, that your processes are are robust, and discretion is very hard to measure, because obviously monitoring outcomes are are quite black and white, but obviously discretion is about nuanced sort of picking up on. Um, picking up on things and interviewing well, so asking people, well, tell me more about that in order to get the full story. I think some of our respondents were quite aware that they hadn't put them, themselves across as well as they might do. And there were examples of people who had, had felt that they put themselves across a wee bit better when they had someone there to help them. And so in, in that respect, some of the some of the recommendations around signposting and getting people in contact with people who can help them put across their... Um, their story well it is useful but it, it's about the staff 
being good listeners and good questioners, and that's that's quite a nuanced sort of area of, of, of training, and, and not without cost, of course. Of course. Um, I mean, I've always been a supporter of discretion in the, the benefit system at large, and I'm just sorry to see that it was uh, removed many decades ago and never restored by any subsequent government at Westminster. Um, I think it's an uh, essential component of fairness, discretion, but I do take uh, on board very much what you said about culture issues, training issues, uh, and monitoring and accountability. Um, can I also ask in terms of, of uh, hardship payments and the DWP, I mean, what was kind of the experience of awareness, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the ability to actually receive hardship payments? I mean, what was, in terms of the respondents that you spoke to, what was their experience of that? Yeah, we, we've had, um, uh, I don't know, maybe... Um, eight or ten people we interviewed had um, had an experience with with applying for hardship fund. Some of them um, got it. Um, um, most didn't, um, and I think most of them did not really like the experience of applying for hardship fund. Uh, fund they they um, um, they found it. Um, um, you know, the questioning, um, um, just not not a very nice experience. Um. Inevitably, some of our respondents do draw comparisons because you know they experience different things in their life, and so th there there were quite positive comparisons between the Scottish Welfare Fund staff and some of the staff they had come in co contact with in the DWP. Because inevitably, you know, they compare how they're treated by some people, and I think the third sector staff also felt that that one of the one of the main advantages and the benefits of 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 the Scottish Welfare Fund was um, that that. The, the, the approach of the staff, whether whether they effectively were were able to um, exercise discretion or not, you know, you needs more work. But they they showed compassion and empathy, and they dealt with people in a way that that was fair and and right. In uh, and I think there were some some less good comparisons with, with the DWP treatment in some cases. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not the first time we've heard that. And I and I would suspect it's, it's not perhaps really much to do with the difference in the individual official. I'm sure that all of them seek to do a good job across the piece and, uh, you know, do the best that they can. It may rather be that it's a, a difference in the kinds of, of, of rules they're applying. And maybe there's a feeling with the, social welfare, the Scottish Welfare Fund that, you know, it, there's ownership of it. We, people have been involved in creating it. They've bought into it, and maybe they don't feel that with some of the rules they're having to apply from the Westminster government. But obviously, I'm not seeking to have you stray into the murky world of politics, so I'll perhaps stop at that point, convener, and pass <coughs> on to somebody else. On the, um, on the issue of, of discretion, um, I, I think um, it, the, the fact that... Um, we are on course to, um, uh, you know, the fund being spent in by the end of the um, having been spent by the end of the financial, uh, the last financial year. Um, uh, I think that's that's a sign that perhaps staff are getting better at, at exercising discretion, um, or gradually did get better at, at doing it over 2000 the last financial year. Uh, and also, obviously, the, the relaxation of eligibility criteria must have um, played a role in that. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. So, uh, thanks, Kavina. Um, I was wondering, just to begin with, uh, have you made any kind of assessment of the success of the fund itself in alleviating hardship? Uh, clearly, this is a replacement for another system, so in some ways we're looking at whether the process works as a replacement, but... In terms of its overall objective of, of, of alleviating hardship, is it successful? Uh, well, um, uh, I, I'm, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I, we ha haven't been asked to compare the Scottish Welfare Fund with the Social Fund, uh, so that's what we, we haven't looked into. But um, it's clear that uh, we, we found clear evidence that where, uh, where uh, applicants uh, were awarded um, uh, full grants or or substantial grants, it did uh, genuinely help uh, help um, alleviate or prevent hardship. 
Um, so um, it's clearly a, a, a useful scheme um, uh, and uh, a scheme that helps, you know, some of the most vulnerable people, uh, people in society. Um, um, likewise, we've, we've found um, evidence that um, where um, applications were rejected or um, partial, like small awards were given, um, um, that um, um, either, you know, um, possibly those were missed opportunities at um, preventing or alleviating hardship. Um, it's the fact that you're not comparing with a previous um, scheme. Um, perhaps uh, uh, maybe you can't answer my next question because it, it strikes me that there's a number of issues around how long it's taking to process. I mean, these are this is emergency uh, help and crisis situations, but there seems to be a number of situations where it's taking a little bit longer than perhaps you would wish, and. Just some of the figures we got as a committee before, it's, it's suggested, it wasn't obvious, but it suggested to me that it's actually slightly slower than the previous system. Now that, frankly, could be because nobody knows about this new system, the old one was very straightforward, everyone knew about it, and um, it's just a teething problem, as it were. Um, Target processing times uh, were um, uh, shorter under the social fund, so that's why probably there is that then under the Scottish Welfare Fund, so that's probably why there is a difference in in uh, you know um, statistics, you know uh, waiting times. Uh, what, what are the targeted pushes, pushes uh, to do before and now? Uh, by the end of the working day f of under this the social fund. And under the welfare. Two fund? working days. Two days, right? And that probably does explain. But <laughs> in our, um, I mean, um, Franca um, is. Um, um, uh, you know, um, um, has has got statistical and administrative um, uh, data regarding waiting times. Our study was a, a qualitative study, and we, you know, our sample was not a random, you know, um, representative sample. So um, um, uh, it's probably better to to ask Scottish government um, research colleagues about about um, average waiting times. Uh, but uh, in our in our sample. Um, the majority of people got their decisions within the, um, the target processing time. However, um, you know, if it's a crisis situation and um, you get your your um, decision after two working days, you know, that may not really um, be fast enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There were examples of people who had, you know, who were situations where the stops really had been pulled out. You know, you did come across people who did get money within a couple of hours mm -hmm. because they really, really needed something. But then, likewise, you did get people who had waited the two days but had no electricity or food. So, uh, and then maybe had gone to a food bank to, in the interim period. So, you know, that the, there's clearly waiting two days has an impact when you have nothing at all and. You know, there's there's no getting away from from Is that. It, you don't know the reason why it's got a two day uh, targeted processing time as opposed to the previous. No. Okay. Um, the the other issue that um, seemed to uh, emerge is that there's a there's still a lack of choice. The applicants themselves um, seem to be grateful and pleased when they are given an award. But there's a number of comments um, about the lack of choice, particularly about the lack of cash and the effect this has. Um, is that something that you, you, you studied in depth or it was just something that emerged from your questioning? Well, it was more um, um, clearly um, Fed sector support organisations were more concerned about the lack of choice than applicants who we interviewed um, themselves. Um, it, in general, as long as the method of payment suited the applicant, they were not too bothered whether it was cash or or um, vouchers for ASDA or you know um, if they were going to do their shopping at ASDA anyway. It did, doesn't matter whether you have cash or vouchers. Uh, so so um, as long as the the method of payment was convenient um, to applicants, um, uh, they they weren't. I mean, a few, a few were concerned about about the lack of choice, but most weren't. Uh, whereas um, support organisations were more concerned about uh, people not having choice, and it possibly um, 
being you know demeaning um, I think there were examples on the other side of, of the coin where people found it easier that you, if they had a carpet fitted and they were quite a vulnerable person for whom actually organising a carpet would be quite a challenge, then actually having someone who would come and just lay a carpet for them or deliver a bed just removed so much of the stress of having to go and find one you know, for, for someone who's quite vulnerable and not really you know, good at shopping or looking for things or measuring things or whatever. So I think there were, there were actually some benefits from having that responsibility taken out of your hands. But I can understand on behalf of the third sectors, who, organisations who are often um, looking for people to have personal responsibility and, 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 and personal choice, then you, they were quite sensitive to that not being there. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, obviously... In an ideal world, you know, people would be given choice of, of mm, the method of payment, but uh, it clearly has cost implications for, for local authorities. So that's why we didn't put forward uh, um, a specific recommendation there regarding, you know. Um, no, I, th I think there's, a, there's an issue in general. The, the, the scheme is coming to replace an existing scheme, and clearly the first priority has to be to make it work and make it work effectively. But there's a second issue, which is um, it, th this is an opportunity to reform the welfare the approach we take to welfare, and it's whether or not you know, for example, is build, trying to trying to improve resilience you know something that we should build into this scheme, or actually, you know, this scheme is for dealing with people in emergencies and crisis, and frankly, you know, resilience is not not to be ignored, but certainly a secondary factor. So it's whether or not we can actually. Um, use your data and your research that you've done here to um, to draw larger you know, to, 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 to illuminate the larger picture about whether or not um, this scheme should be reformed itself it's clearly seems to be working as a replacement for the social fund but there are other obvious areas where we should uh, think about the whole way we're approaching this this subject in terms of its success and helping people in their time of difficulty and also giving them the uh, the, the support that would actually benefit them in, the, in both in the short and the long term. I suppose there it is where signposting becomes very important and it's about not seeing the end, you know, having the carpet or the bed or, th or the money is not the end of the process but the start of another one and that's about linking, making sure that it's, it's not an end point but a start and a link to um, local provision whether it's a social inclusion project or an employability project but it, it it kind of goes full circle and and possibly it's early days for that to be happening but certainly that we identified areas where sign posting could be um could be better well, the scheme itself is not designed to to um 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 deal with causes of long-term poverty and 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 hardship um so um, um, it's, um, but w with with regards to you know what shape um, it may take uh, when when permanent arrangement or in the future or when permanent arrangements are um, in place um, or specified, um, there's obviously our our research there is there is uh, statistical evidence but there's also um uh, i would in suggest to um scottish government um, colleagues to to look at um various um, local welfare assistance schemes that have been um, implemented by by uh, local authorities in england um because uh, there may be you know uh, um specific you know, um, um, solutions that they've implemented, which are not part of the interim arrangements for the Scottish Welfare Scheme, but which could be perhaps part of permanent arrangements. Um, I've had a look at, um, just recently, I've had a look at um, what um, Leeds City Council, Manchester City Council and, and Liverpool City Council have um, uh, have done, how, how they've... Um, uh, what their local welfare assistance schemes um, look like, and um, there are some. Um, they've definitely, you know, um, 
developed some solutions which are not part of the Scottish Welfare Fund at the moment, which may be, you know, um, um, of relevance and uh, possibly could be part of permanent arrangements. So I can only encourage Scottish government colleagues to, uh, you know, to study some of some of those local welfare yeah. assistance schemes. Can I ask one final brief question, uh, Kavina, which is just that just this this issue of choice again. Clearly, some some uh, applicants uh, were given, you know. Um, yeah, a starter kit for their flat, and they were very grateful not to have to go and, you know, find a carpet and a cooker and all the rest. Um, others um, were. Others, others would have said, you know, others said, uh, I could have got a better bed myself, you know, and so on. Were you able to make a diff uh, any kind of um, analysis of who had choice and who didn't have choice, and whether that choice, the fact that they had choice or not, was an important factor? Some would be grateful no matter what. But how important was it to have choice? And were you able to make any kind of qualitative assessment or comparison between um, the, the, their satisfaction or the outcome of the process and the success of the process in, in, in helping them um, with the element of choice itself? Well, um, I think it's... Um, what we found was that people who um, didn't like the condition or the look of the items they received then said, yes, I would prefer to, to have some choice in the first place. Um, but if, if what people have received was, you know, of satisfactory quality and, and they would have got similar items anyway, then they were kind of less concerned about the lack of choice. I don't know. I suppose some, sometimes there were a few examples where people got a voucher where it, it it was quite difficult to spend it. So sometimes they had the choice, but it was quite difficult for them to get something for that amount of money that fulfilled their needs. So in the areas where you were given a fridge, you could definitely get a fridge because you were given a fridge, whereas in other areas where you were given £125 and all you could find were fridges for £140, then effectively you had to find some money, and that was quite difficult. So it's, it's difficult because... Because choice isn't always choice if it doesn't fulfil the the need. So it, I think it's it's probably a bit too simple to say that where people had choice they were happier than where they didn't have choice. Because sometimes having choice meant that. Yeah, the choice I was meaning was not between having one hundred and twenty five pounds and that gives you choice. I mean, the, the difference between you can either have a fridge or you can have a voucher. That choice. Yes, I think some people admitted that they wouldn't have bought the fridge if they'd had the money. Some, quite honestly, saying, "Well, I needed a fridge, but if I'd been, you know, people, Fred's yes, else, yeah. I would maybe not have bought a fridge." And you know, certainly, the third sector organisations raised that as an issue that, where people have very little money, it's mm -hmm. very hard for them to make good choices, or you know, but it's but very it hard. Um, I think I think the. Um, those few interviews where people mentioned made this kind of statement, they, they didn't mean that they would, you know, go and spend it on booze. They meant, no, you know, they, they, they would spend it on shoes rather than, you know, the fridge, that yeah. kind of... Uh, it's the heart of, you know, resilience. The whole point is that people, if you give people freedom, they make the wrong choices. But that's that's the whole point of resilience, is making your choices for yourself. Anyway. Big, big issue. Right. Um, thank you, convener. Uh, and uh, I'm interested in the um, signposting and the advertising and the awareness um, of the fund itself. Um, did you come across any uh, areas, any local authorities, uh, where you felt that there was more awareness of the fund being in existence? And if so, uh, what were they doing differently from some of the others? Uh, in terms of advertising, signposting the fund? Aware, uh, the knowledge and awareness of advertising was very low over across, across the board. I, I would struggle to think of a local authority that we could hold up as an example of someone who had you know, made a big splash and people were very aware of it. Um, I think across the board, where people were in touch with their housing association or their council or someone who who could signpost them to the scheme, um, it worked well. Our concern is that there are people who are not in touch with a lot of services and so m are possibly falling through the net and that just generally um, 
awareness. Certainly when we did the research, it could be better now. Awareness was quite low. Also, it needs to be remembered that, uh, you know, when the, the scheme was um, implemented, uh, there was so much going on in, in terms of welfare reform that perhaps some of advertising um, efforts of, from local authorities were not productive because sub third sector organizations were more, you know, um, preoccupied with, with other welfare reform um, changes. That, that's inevitably one of the, the difficulties in terms of this massive change happening all at one time, uh, it's very difficult um, to, for folk to get their heads around some of the, the very basic uh, things. Uh, and obviously, like everything else, you're, you're focused on the one that affects you most rather than what you may see at that point in time as being minutiae. Um, you, you talked about those folks who um, already had contact with social workers or, or um, other third sector organisations too. Um, being the ones who were most likely to be signposted um, uh, to to the fund. Um, did you find in any parts of the country that um, social workers or food bank staff or, or, or other organisations were better at that signposting than others? Were you asking folks where they heard about the fund um, and what, what help they had in, tr in trying to get uh, to access the fund? I did um, a fair amount of interviewing in Glasgow, and Glasgow is obviously a, a you know, very different um, environment than other places, so it has historically a very wide network of organisations. It has um, a really very large housing association sector, very strong community-based work, wider role, very important across, across the board there. So I'd say in Glasgow... If there's lesson learning from within Scotland, I think you know Glasgow has a lot of very interesting things going on and lots of people very, um, very connected to services because of, you know, going back to sort of old partnerships um, across Glasgow. So there was um, a lot of a lot of service provision there. So people would probably know to go to the Govan Law Centre or Money Matters or or various various places in Glasgow that are just well renowned for helping you so they're very networked i would i suppose I, I would have some concerns whether the coverage in some rural areas where there just isn't the same level of provision might be quite patchy in comparison to the to the cities and i think dundee's probably quite similar in, in terms of that mm -hmm. um well we've also found some evidence that um um some support organizations um were um, who were unsuccessful with um, um, support, like supporting applicants to the Scottish Welfare Fund, uh, in, in that in that those applicants did did not get uh, were rejected, um, uh, their applications were rejected, then they were um, kind of discouraged from further, you know, um, 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 I. I don't know from how would you say that from. Um yeah, I, I suppose we did come across some third sector organisations that had possibly had a few negative experiences before the eligibility criteria were relaxed, and that coloured their judgment about whether they would, you know, whether they would suggest that as a route for people in in in, in need in future. Um, so I suppose for some of the some of the less. Um, specialist organisations, they may be um, needing ev even more sort of um, information or um, outreach to, to get them back into the process. I think the likes of Money Matters and the Govan Law Centre and very, very strongly welfare-orientated organisations will always use the fund heavily and encourage people towards it heavily. Some more minority um third sector organisations, if they have a bad experience and they don't see it as something that helps their service users, they, they may, may need to be brought back into the, um, into the process more. I, I found in, in my own neck of the woods in Aberdeen, Seafine, for example, who um, uh, are a food fair share organisation and also have a, a food bank, they've been referring folk, obviously, to the fund. But beyond that, they have the um, ability, I would say, to, to help folk in other ways to try and, and move forward. 
Um, do you think the staff who are dealing with the Scottish Welfare Fund are signposting folks onto um, other things as, as well as they should be to try and get them out of, of the crisis situation? Or is that not happening yet? I, th I think it's still quite variable. There were examples of people people being signposted if they didn't get Scottish Welfare Fund, so they would be signposted towards food banks, very much kind of crisis response, trying to deliver something. Um, I, I came across less and was less aware of more positive signposting that, you know, we have helped you, and also as well as helping you in your current situation, we're going to point you to this other furniture project or this employability project or you know something else. I I think that part of it in terms of being holistic I don't think that's happening across so the future board. preventative um, scenarios aren't in place yet yeah we we found it patchy and that's why we put forward a, a recommendation that um, decision letters should um, signpost people um, to you know um, support organizations in the in the area um, that I, I think that would definitely improve um, you know um, make make it more joined up and holistic and and um, ultimately you know um, um, this this ambition of this you know the, the main reason for for local one of the main reasons for for localizing um social fund was that um um local authorities would be better at integrating support so um signposting is clearly you know at the at the heart of of um of of um um achieving that um um, that, that that ambition. So that's why that recommendation we put that as recommendation. I think it was Miss Little that said that this is possibly because <coughs> it is in its early stages. Um, in the the work that you've done, um, and obviously you've done some previous work too. Um, do you think that um, there is a learning process going on, and that folk are actually um, adapting to try and make things? much, much better um, than, than they were? Or, or is it all too much for folk? Well, clearly, you know, there are time constraints. If you are a decision maker and you've got uh, another person on the line, you know, um, you are under pressure to answer that other call rather than spend, you know, five or ten minutes signposting. Um, so that needs to be taken in, in, into consideration. Um, but also there may be it's just um you know um um it may be that um, um revenues and benefits staff have um you know um are less familiar with the local um landscape you know support landscape than social work um st uh, department staff so that's probably where um you know, more joined up, a pro, more, more joined up work between the two departments would would be beneficial. Which would be an interest to in terms of future prevention. Mm -hmm. Are there any mm -hmm. local authorities that you came across who have started that situation of 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 integration and not just relying on revenues and benefit staff, but bringing others in, um, welfare rights and and others in to help in the process? Well, we, we haven't interviewed, um, you know, uh, local authorities that uh, we, we just um, spoke to um, applicants and third sector organisations and third sector organisations because they they were mostly um, cut off the decision making process. They, you know, they um, um, they had, um, no, I don't think with. Uh, yeah, it, it's this. difficult to, sit to to see what has been laid from the local authority because obviously um, we, we didn't speak to local authority representatives specifically. I think in Glasgow there are examples of partnerships. That I think the local authority is kind of working with uh, the Wheatley Group and other, other um, RSLs, registered social landlords in Glasgow, in, in, 
because they already have quite a strong partnership approach there. So I think certainly there will be local authorities who have existing partnership approaches and will probably be more able to, to involve other people and, and to tap into other resources. And so there's probably a bit of learning there to be had. Um, I suspect some other, again, rural authorities would be less networked um, because particularly where you get the local authority who's also the main housing provider of social housing and doesn't have a necessarily a big network of um, housing associations or other providers to, to tap into, then that's more of a challenge. There, there will be good examples out there of partnership working, but um, you know, it, it wasn't the, the remit of our study to find them. So, but, but, they, but they certainly exist because we know, you know from other work that, that they're there. Thank you very much. Thank you, convener. Linda. Oh, sorry, can you... uh, I think most things that I was going to raise have been covered, but I'd like to pick up on a couple of them. Uh, I think what's coming through very, very strongly is that, uh, the training requirement. That's not to say people haven't been doing a very good job in, in what is a new scheme, but we may now, convener, be at the, the natural break point you know, of this review where you say, well, let's re-look at the training. And I like the, the idea more of the, the holistic approach and joint training uh, that allows um, that signposting that we're talking about. So, so I think that's really important and to be emphasised. The other thing that, that worried me a bit, and um, Ken raised it, was one of your recommendations about encouraging ways of speeding up the decision process, particularly for crisis grants. And it, when you look at the, the definition of a crisis grant, um, an emergency or disaster, uh, and then you think that perhaps they're not operating as quickly as they should. Uh, again, I wonder whether that's about uh, almost a judgment, and I think the word judgmental is used in the study by a couple of people, a judgment that it's not quite the crisis that the person thinks it is, um, and whether you picked up a feeling of what could be done to make, to make that better, and a crisis is indeed a crisis. Would you change the two-day criteria, for example? Because sometimes organisations work towards a target, you know, rather than dealing with something very quickly. Well, clearly, um, applicants, crisis grant applicants we've spoken to, they would welcome a, a shorter um, target processing time. Um, um, there are obviously resource implications uh, as well, um, because, you know, if... Um, somebody's phoning at quarter to five, you know, then um, for, for, for a crisis grant and the target is by the end of the working day, then somebody needs to stay after hours and, you know, to, to process that application. Um, 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 but also I, um, you know, there is, there is an issue of um, um, whether um it it could be possible to process crisis grant applications uh, out of working working hours and um and during weekends because if, if it is a crisis then you know it may happen quarter past 5 you know um so um yeah. that sort of led me on to my next bit and this is entirely anecdotal i, d I d you know uh, that i've picked up is that if you have a crisis on a Friday afternoon, you can't see anybody till the Monday. I mean, have you come across um, any administrators of the crisis grants and welfare fund generally that do have a helpline, for example, over a weekend? Um, no. no it's very... I suppose it's the downside of having, um, having a scheme that's administered by revenues and benefits. It's a, a nine-to-five service and unless local authorities want to use their out of our social work service perhaps to you know as an alternative to to cover the, the hours which obviously has its own coordination difficulties because then you're involving t two departments instead of one um, but but certainly I didn't come across the third sector talking about a weekend service well, um well, in my interviews with with third sector, they uh, yeah this this issue uh, issue has has come up, but um, but uh, it also um, came up in applica in a few applicant interviews 
and people were clearly upset that they couldn't access um, emergency help during um, uh, over over the weekend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, again about monitoring. Um, I mean, uh, again, anecdotally, I have heard cases where emergency social work has helped out, and you know, and then person is referred on. Um, so the emergency has been dealt with, and then they're referred to the, the, the welfare fund. And again, I wonder if the monitoring of that is such that that kind of thing would become apparent, or whether the monitoring would be such that when the person actually presents themselves at SWS staff, that would look like the first uh, contact. So when you talk about, I think it was... Every attempt at applying should be logged onto the system. Um, how would you deal, do you think it should be dealt with, for example, if social work department have dealt with it and then referred on to SWS? Yeah, that's a difficult one, because the social work department might have been using their own Section 12 or other arrangements themselves in order to, because you know, they have their own crisis funds, so they, they might well have filled the stop gap with their crisis funds or their crisis arrangements, and then separately the person um, approached SWF because it's you know there are quite sort of yeah, sort of so co more complex back cases back there. to the almost the lack of a holistic approach to things mm -hmm. well um, in to my knowledge section 12 um, is harder to get than than um, Scottish welfare fund so if somebody goes to social work department for a section 12 payment um, uh, because this, the Scottish Welfare Fund is out of out of office, you know, out of hours. Um, um, the person maybe, you know, the chances of being successful are, are, are smaller, at least to my to my knowledge. Um. Alex, thank you, convener. It was a it's a very good report, uh, extremely useful, uh, but of necessity, it's a snapshot. Would that be? Fair to say. The, given the, the timings, the, we've gone through uh, a year in which there was a great deal of variation uh, and some serious problems in some areas uh, with the scheme uh, in its early days, and that had to be sorted out very quickly. Are you confident that the timing of the snapshot has eliminated that early variation uh, from the scheme? Well, most of the people we interviewed um, applied for the scheme um, in the autumn and winter last year. So that was a good half a year after after it started um, operating. Some of them applied in July and August last year, so that was that was closer to, to the beginning of the scheme. But most most applied when when you know um, the scheme was was bedded in. Um, the timing, uh, yeah, there's. Because the guidance was changed in October uh, last year, um, some of our uh, some of people we interviewed applied before the guidance changed. Some of them applied after the guidance changed, and it's um, so in um, in this respect, it wasn't you know it wasn't perfect. Uh, but um, um, and obviously, we didn't pick up um, the the um, experiences of people after the latest change to the guidance in, in April this year. Um, but um, it was, um, yes, it was a snapshot, but because we interviewed quite a number of people, it, it's quite a robust mm -hmm. snapshot, I would say. You know, the, the kind of standard for qualitative social research is to um, have 40, you know, 50 um, in you know interviews and with it 77 so I think it is quite robust in this uh, sense. I'm, I'm confident that it's robust. Uh, I, I don't have issue, any issues with your methodology uh, but the, the one other uh, area where we discovered significant variation especially in the early part of the scheme was between local authority areas. 
uh, where the performance in certain local authority areas was vastly superior to the performance in others initially. And again, that has been uh, evened out to some extent. A, a sample of 77 uh, of necessity cannot cover 32 local authority areas. To what extent was there a geographical spread within your 77? We've covered 13 local authorities um, and um, from on uh, from uh, cover, covering every you know point of the urban rural scale, so from large urban to to remote rural. Uh, but yes, that's 13 out of 32. Um, so obviously, we found some evidence of variation in in quality of delivery between local authorities. But because we've only covered 13 uh, local authorities, and it wasn't you know uh, like a large scale survey we we can't really um make firm statements um um here but uh, clearly you know the scottish government um the, the policy makers will need to um um consider consider how to make sure that um there's no postcode lottery postcode lottery once the permanent arrangements are are in place so that you know one local authority does really badly and um there is no no mechanism in place to make it, you know, improve um, the delivery. There was some evidence in the very early days of the scheme that there were massive differences in performance, uh, two to three hundred percent variation in, in performance. Uh, are you confident uh, from the, the timing of your interviews that that wild variation uh, was effectively eliminated in the second half of this year's scheme? Well, we we. In our in our study, we didn't uh, find um, anything like that. You know that wide uh, wide um, variation in the quality of delivery. We found some you know differences, but not not massive. But uh, like I said, you know maybe maybe um, because of of um, which local authorities we we sampled, um, we didn't get the full picture so we, we can't make a firm statement here on on what's actually happened to this variation in in the quality of delivery i think i think in future there's clearly a role for ongoing monitoring and you know if there if there were significant variations at the start and there've been improvements made now so there's not so significant variations in order to keep that the case then obviously the way the way forward is to to have ongoing monitoring or ad hoc revisits through your ongoing I mean the, the Scottish government do have a sort of scheme where they where they visit I think the SWF or you know they have quality these they have these quality improvement visits so that's obviously there's a there's an in there you know there's a, there's a kind of structure there to to use to maintain the the quality um, and we've recommended sort of ongoing monitoring as part of the of being embedded within the process and I think that will be important to make sure that everybody um, stays on their toes and, and keeps the you know keeps the, the quality going. No question was going to be uh, do you feel this is an exercise that would be worthwhile doing again in a year's time um, either for interim schemes or for successor schemes? I, I think the the customer perspective is always really important. I think your your quantitative monitoring always gives you the 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 raw numbers and you can interpret them. But there is always use in in speaking to uh, to people on the ground about their their experience of things, and it's it's always a great insight. It's not always affordable. You can't always say that you'll do it on an annual basis or or you know commit yourself to that. But certainly. Um, a qualitative aspect to, uh, and, and making sure you have some sort of voice in there for the for the consumer is always always useful. Perhaps uh, some of these elements might lend themselves to the work of a parliamentary committee, for example. <laughs> Thank you very much. That looks as if I've exhausted our questions, so can I thank you very much for yeah, coming and, uh, and helping us with uh, our understanding of your your report. Um, can I ask one final question? Are you continuing with any work in respect to this, or have you completed this? And um, uh, is there anything else that we might benefit from your knowledge? Uh, uh, well, I'm I'm now um, leading on a on a major element of the of a of a of a JRF funded study on destitution in the UK, um, and um, 
um, definitely this is you know uh, relevant. Then we we, we <laughs> um, may see you before us again if you, you would take up an invitation to come and. Thank uh, you, and us. I've uh, I've applied for for um, research funding um, from the Royal Institute for Chartered Surveyors for for a small study on food banks um, regarding what proportion of um, families um, that are uh, households that are food insecure. Uh, do not have access to food aid, uh, but I'm still awaiting um, the, um, the decision. If I, yeah, so if I get that funding, that, that so that would be that interesting to us as, uh, as a committee. So we may mm. we may be in touch with you again at some point. But thanks very much this morning for your help again. Thank you. Okay, I'll suspend the meeting for five minutes uh, before we go. To, um, but we're going to uh, private session at this time. Okay.